All right, so welcome to the uh, one-on-one training today. Um, my name is Willis, and um, a bit of fun fact. So I joined in Rag two years ago, and uh, before me, there's actually an another engineer also called Will Lee, working uh, from the San Francisco office, supporting the Australian business. So if you go to YouTube or Google, search for New Relic, you'll probably see a training from Will Lee that's being hit by a million times. That isn't me. That's the other Will Lee uh, from our San Francisco office. So, fantastic. So welcome to the new uh, one-on-one -on -one training. So it's, this is designed for, you know, obviously you want to learn about APM or you started using APM and you want to learn a bit more and become certified. If you want to learn about the end-to-end -end stuff, like browser and other stuff, um, the 202 training track is probably more suitable for you guys. So in terms of the agenda today, we'll, we'll cover how APM works, give you a bit of an overview, and touch, of, uh, touch on a couple of the uh, basic topics. Uh, there's a couple of lab exercises as well along the way. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, you know, the new certification um, as well. So uh, my colleague Andrew is here. Do you want to say hello to the rest? Yep. So Andrew and I be belong to the technical services team. And um, if you have any issues logging into your training account, um, here's an email address um, that you can get some help from Andrew. So any issues with your login account, um, email Andrew and he will sort you out. So for those who just came in, uh, you should see an email in your inbox about your training account. So just click on it. If you have existing New Relic account, just log in using your uh, existing username and password, and then you'll be able to switch to that training account from the drop-down menu. If you have SSO set up with your existing account, also email Andrew, because we have to set up uh, another username using your um, you know, Gmail or uh, personal email address. OK, so yes. Be, so normally this session is like six to eight hours you know, long. So we only got two hours. There's a 20 minutes uh, break in the middle. So we'll be moving pretty fast. Um, I'm going to kick start it. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover um, just some basic stuff about how APM works, um, how to set up new Relic. And then I'll jump into an account, show you a couple things. Um, and then we'll give you access to the training account, do some labs as well. OK, cool. So let's talk about how APM works. So APM obviously, obviously stands for Application Performance Management. Um, it's our core offering of the new Relic platform. So in terms of how it works, um, it all starts from a piece of agent, a piece of software that you download from the New Relic website. So obviously, APM stands for application, so it's obviously related to your application server. right? So typically, you install APM on your application server. And these are the different languages that we support. So um, you know, .NET, Java, PHP, Node.js, Ruby, Python, and also Golang as well. So once you install the agent, typically, it will involve a restart as well. So when you install New Relic, if you don't see any traffic or data after you know, 10, 15 minutes, typically you haven't um, restarted your server. I mean, there's other cases as well, but that's typically the case. So uh, once you restart the uh, web server, the agent will become part of your um, application. It dep depends on the languages, but typically it's you know, bytecode instrumentation, uh, and we do some you know, typical instrumentation at the certain framework entry points. And the agent will start picking up the incoming transactions, the API calls, and all that um, kind of fun stuff. So New Relic is a SaaS-based software. So all the data will be sent to our collector in the cloud in Chicago. So we got our proprietary data center in Chicago, and that's all the data will be sent there. Um, so back to your customers, back to your application. When, when your customer now access your, your web application, your mobile application, your browser application, uh, those transactions will be picked up by, by New Relic. And uh, you as a New Relic user, you'll be able to see the New Relic data through uh, the New Relic UI. Or uh, we also got a mobile app as well. 
So in terms of the digital platform that you might have seen from the presentation earlier today, um, today we're going to focus on the core foundation of the, of the middle, the, the APM stuff um, regarding your application performance. Just to give you a couple things in terms of what else you can do with the platform. Um, so again, today with the 101 track, uh, it's all about APM. It's going to be, you know, hopefully helping you, um, you know, get a taste of APM and also help you certify with the program that I'm going I'm to touch on at the end of the session. So if you guys are interested, for example, like you know, tracking your EC2 or your servers, that's what this infrastructure product does. Um, and also, we got a couple of flavors of monitoring your mobile apps, monitoring your front end, uh, and, and, and tracking baseline as well using different flavors of offering. Um, that is, um, will be covered by the 202 track. So it's not too late to uh, move to the other room if you want to know about those guys. So everything will be bubbled up into Insights. So Insights is obviously our flagship dashboarding product, which you have seen some of the cool dashboard today in the session. Uh, you can also do, do query as well. So it's an analytics uh, offering as well as a dashboarding offering. Uh, we might touch on some of that Insights stuff today. Uh, what else? So we got um, you know things that we're going to cover today. We got APIs that you can automate things. You know we can we can automate new relic and, and integrate to your uh, process. Uh, we also got alerts, obviously that we can, we can alert you when there's things going wrong with your applications, right? So we're going to touch on those uh, as well. Okay. Um, if you have questions along the way, I would recommend you, uh, because of time, like leave the questions towards the uh, the break or the end of the session, and you know just just find find a guy with the new like uh, feature stack t-shirts, and you can you can ask those questions. Cool. So I am going to go to the um, training account. Cool. And. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through how the Relic APM can help troubleshooting performance issues. I'm going to use a, a demo account to do this for the first time, and then I'll get you guys to use the training account to do some of that um, in the meantime. Okay, so I'm looking at the service map component of the APM product, right? So basically, when you deploy um, the agents on your application server, um, the, the APM agent will automatically pick up the incoming transactions from the browser, and then it will also look at the, uh, the internal transactions between your different services. So what you can see here is this is a you know, pretty, pretty basic microservice architecture with you know, the front end with a couple of services um, behind the scenes supporting things like you know, ordering services, uh, authentication services, and so forth. Obviously, there's a couple of databases as well. So you can see all that in the service map. It's fully automated. So it's basically um, visualizing your architecture based on your new Relic deployment, right? So if you don't install the agent on your application server, then you won't see the, the traffic going there, right? So you know, this is an instrumented um, architecture map, if you like. So it's automated. Um, it's always going to show you the last 30 minutes of um, data. So you can see there's, a, there's an issue here with the uh, order service. And then you can understand how it triggers up to the, to, the, to the front end and to the end user as well. So it's, service map is good for you know, understanding your architecture in real time and also understanding the dependencies. So let's do a quick um, troubleshooting exercise here into the order service um, application. So, oh, okay, it's pretty busy. Let's go back to 60 minutes. Okay, so before I go through the you know troubleshooting exercise and the fun stuff, I just want to walk you through a couple of fundamentals. So um, you can monitor as many applications as you want in Relic, and you can switch between your different applications using that drop-down menu. So that's um, quite easy to access other stuff. Um, depends on your subscription t um, type, um, you might have access to maybe 24 hours for the light tier. Um, or you know, uh, three days for the essentials tier, so up to three months for the pro tier. 
So um, these drop-down menus allow you to um, look at different, different data retention. So uh, you can always use the end now option to say, okay, give me the last day of data um, from this point onward. So it will give you that um, visualization. Or, you know, I want to troubleshoot something over the weekend. So I, I can use the custom date um, uh, option to say, okay, give me uh, last 24 hours from Sunday um, about midday. So I can do that as well. And that will, be, that will allow me to jump back to that time frame. Um, depends on the language that you use. You can switch between you know, the, your different JVMs, your different containers, or different servers. So that server menu here will allow you to, to switch to look at a specific you know, instance. Right? So that's, that's quite a handy thing. Uh, and you, you will notice that um, the time picker, we deliberately fixed that. So when you troubleshoot, when you do troubleshooting, when you go to the browser, um, portion, for example, to look at the front end, um, you'll be able to see that um, the time picker is actually fixed to that time as well. So I'm still looking at the Sunday time. So it helps in terms of troubleshooting when you're traveling through you know, your, your core application, your infrastructure, or going, going out to the front end and have a look at the data. You're always tied to that time frame. So from, for, from a troubleshooting perspective, that's why we did the, that behavior with the time picker option. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's pretty much what I want to cover in terms of um, the, the, the basic stuff uh, on the top here. So let's do a quick um, troubleshooting exercise here. So I can pick any of these interesting spikes. I can click and drag on the graph. And that basically does you know, drilling down to that particular time frame as well. Um, so what I can see here is, um, you know, before I drill down, uh, let me just walk you through a couple of things. So we got the app deck score um, on the on the right. So that's an indication of your um, customer satisfaction based on the metrics that we collect. So obviously, when performance goes bad, um, the 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 app deck uh, index goes down. So the 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 best score is one, and um, you know the the the, the worst the application performed. The, the app desk score will drop. So I just want to switch back to my slide and i um, going to cover off the app desk stuff a bit more details. Okay, yeah. So yeah, the, the app desk score stuff does come up in the certification. That's why we're spending a little bit of time going through that. Okay, so app desk stands for application performance uh, index. It's an industry standard. So New Relic didn't really invent that. We just incorporated that standard into our product. So you'll see that in uh, APM and browser. So we evaluate all the incoming um, transactions. We look at a couple things. We look at the response code, and we look at the respond time, right? So let's look at the response time scenario. So we compare the response time uh, of the transaction against a little t value or, or thresholds, right? So all the um, application when you deploy into New Relic, it starts with a half a second t value. So if you don't change that, uh, we'll use the half a second as a t value. And then we compare the transaction response time against that. If it's within half a second, great. We'll set, say that is a satisfied transaction. If it's over half a second, we say that's a to tolerating transaction. Uh, if it's really slow, if it's taking four times the t value to complete that transaction, so in this case, 0 0.5 times 4 is 2 seconds. So if it's taking more than 2 seconds, then we say that as a frustrated transactions. Now, jumping back to the response code, if the response code is not the one that we're looking for, so obviously, you know, the, the 300, the 200 is OK. But when it gets to like 500, you know, or 4, 401, then we'll categorize those as frustrated transactions. And any transaction that results as an exception, uh, we also categorize that as an, a frustrated transaction. So once we got all the data, uh, then we'll use this equation to calculate AppDAC. So basically, uh, all the satisfied requests plus half of the tolerating requests over the total number of requests uh, over any given time. So best AppDAC score will be 1. Uh, and then as it drops you know, below 0.8 or 0.5, that's where we start triggering alerts and trace. So um, yeah, so when it comes to you know, like choosing an AppDex value when you start using New Relic, you don't want to choose too low. 
um, because we will, send, we will send you a lot of alerts and you, you probably you know, start to ignore those. That that's something that we don't want. Um, if it's set too high, then we won't necessarily understand there's an issue from a neural network standpoint. So a couple of things on top of the, um, the T value. So um, when the transaction is over uh, four T, basically a frustrated transaction, we'll also capture a trace, right? So you know, when you drill down to look at the, um, uh, the, the code level stuff, the, the trace function only triggers when it's exceeding the, uh, the thresholds four times. So, so, so again, if you choose a, in, in, in appropriate T value, then we might not capture the trace um, for you to troubleshoot further. So ideally, um, you want to look at um, maybe a two-week time window and pick the average value uh, as the T value to start from. And, and bear in mind, different applications perform differently, right? So if your application is taking, you know, 0.8 seconds to, to, to happen on average, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just your app, it's the nature of your application. So you, you need to basically look at your uh, response time over a period of time and adjust your T value. Okay, going back to the... Okay, so we cover AppDAX. Um, T value is half a second by default. Uh, we capture a trace if it's 4T, and then AppDAX score is always between 0 and 1. That's, uh, you know, cheat sheet for you. Um, we look at throughput as well. So obviously when you try to troubleshoot issues, you want to know whether the application server is being smashed by increased amount of traffic. So it's there for you to access. And then we bubble up the uh, important information for you as well. So underneath the overview graph, you got access to the exceptions. So that's the error rate. We look into that. And we also can access the slowest performing transactions. So um, these are just top five. Um, when you click on the transactions um, on the, on the left-hand side, you, you'll be able to access everything else as well. OK. So the, the main overview um, graph here is an average response time of your web transaction. So uh, it's also nicely being break down by the different technologies that you, got, you might have in your stack. So in this case here, I got a database, so I can visualize the database time. Uh, there's a little bit of the, you know, the external gateway stuff, like payment gateway or, or uh, things that you run in the cloud. So we track that timing as well. And obviously, we, we capture the time in your code. So that's why you, know, you can see different, time, uh, different color tiers um, in the graph. So that's one way of visualizing the data. Um, the other things that um, customers usually found useful is to look at the, the median response time and the 95 percentile. Right? So you can access that option from the drop-down menu. Uh, the middle guy histogram is quite interesting as well. So you can see the distribution of the response time of your transactions. So I can see that most of my transactions is happening between 0 to 25 milliseconds. And then there's a little hump here that takes a little you know, longer. So these are the ones that I want to target, right? These are the ones that, for example, in this case, the order post transaction is the one that I want to optimize or look into at least because um, you know, there's, a, there's a middle hump here that um, showing up here. And then all this outlier is interesting as well. Um, so you can literally access, access the histogram to, to not just understand the distribution, but also you know, identify the low-hanging fruits, and then you can drill down from there. Um, we don't talk about this much, but there's also a time slide here. So you can slide between a different time to look at the different distribution. So this is useful when you are looking at peak distribution versus you know, off-peak um, distribution in terms of response time. So that's pretty cool. OK. Um, so let's troubleshoot this. So I can see that um, doesn't always work, doesn't it? Um, you see a little, little, um, little green line here. Um, I suppose to be able to mouse over that and see the deployment marker. Um, not quite happened for me. That's OK. But basically, when you, whenever you see a green line on the bar, that's one of the features that I will cover probably in the second half of the session is the deployment marker. So when you push code out, you can tell New Relic, hey, I made a, I made a change in, the, in production. 
and I can, I can mark that event in the graphs. So it becomes useful when you know, the production guys is trying to troubleshoot something that happens overnight or over the weekend. So it's always there to help you understand what's going on before and after. So obviously, there was a deployment happened there. Um, the, the database timing started to change. So maybe I want to drill down to that database tier. So you can click on the graph to um, drill down to the, oh, not that one. Yep. So once you click on the tier that you're interested, um, you will be redirected to one of the sections on the left. So because I just click on database, that will opens up the database report for me. Uh, I'm still looking at the same time frame again. So when you're troubleshooting, when you're jumping through different tabs, um, you'll be able to stick with that time frame. So now I'm looking at the database stuff. So it, New Relic tells me that there's two types of um, uh, queries being executed on my MySQL database. And one of those um, is not performing that well after the deployment uh, event, the order select one. So I can drill down to that. And when I scroll down further, it will also tell me a, a couple of more things. So I can understand the throughput of the queries, the SQL statements. Uh, this is interesting. So there's a lot of tools out there that tells you database performance, but it doesn't necessarily tell you the context of the application. So um, this is where you know, uh, New Relic comes into play, uh, is that we tell you what part of the application is calling that query and how often the transaction is calling those. So it gives you context of, you know, of the application as well, not just the database performance. Um, so that's... That's useful because you can understand how this slow query is impacting different functions and pages on the website or uh, an application in, in your world. And then uh, when you drill to the bottom of the, the page here, you can also access the example of the slow queries. Um, so it's telling me that there's a couple examples here that takes you know, 1.2 seconds or 1.8 seconds. So uh, these are all you, know, you can drill down to understand more. So you can see that from, you know, with a couple clicks, you can start from a peaked um, spike in the overview graph all the way down to the query. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? So let's do another one quickly here. Uh, let's drill into the, another peak here. So this looks to be a different problem. Um, I'm interested in the green part, so I'm going to drill into the external timing. Um, so this will automatically picks up basically anything that your application talks to, uh, whether it's an internal application that you host or manage or something that hosts it in the cloud or some other third-party stuff that your application leverage. So in this case, the order service is talking to another service called infantry service to do some transac um, transactions. So from here, you can understand the performance of those transactions um, if you have new relic installed on the other side, uh, you can also do what we call cross application tracing. So there's a couple places that you can do, like you know, jumping to different applications to understand more. Um, this particular link here is one of those. So when you click on that, um, you move to the infantry service to the transaction that was being called from the other side, and then you can continue the troubleshooting. So that's one area where you can do this, this um, cross application tracing. The other, um, yep, yeah, so okay. So let me go back to the order service here. Um, let's change the time frame a little bit. Okay, so before I drill down, I just want to go through a couple of things. So uh, the transaction report is probably uh, you know, so something that you will spend a lot of time, apart from the overview, because you, know, you, you want to see the breakdown right, right away when you see a spike or a change in response time pattern. So the response time uh, of the different transactions is something that you will be able to find in the transaction report. So um, for those who have used NIMRAG before, obviously, uh, it will pick up a lot of the uh, things out of the box, your API calls, your, your backend transactions, and all that. Uh, in this case, the, 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 the most time-consuming transaction in this case is the order service. So 
Uh, when I drill down to that transactions, um, very similar to the overview graph, it will show me the different time spent in different types of technologies, such as you know, the MySQL uh, component, and you can see it's calling some, some things in the, in, the, uh, in the ELB stack, um, and other internal traffic with the other um, service on the other side as well. So you'll be able to see um, you know, where time is being contributed for this particular transaction. Uh, throughput is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, so this breakdown table is really useful as well. So basically, it's presenting the same information that you will see here, um, but in a, in a table format. So obviously, you'll be able to see uh, where's the most painful part of the application. So in this case, it's the database tier. Uh, and you can also understand for this particular transaction, how many times the transaction is calling the database. Is it like calling 10 times or 15 times just for that one transaction? So you'll be able to understand that um, as well. But most importantly, you know, you'll be able to access the trace as well. So we talk about if the transaction is 40, um, we'll capture a trace for you. So this is the area that you can access the trace. So let's pick one of these here. Um, so as a developer, this is you know, very useful, right? So I can see um, for a particular transaction at a particular time, what was the response time? Uh, you know, where was it being executed? Is it on a particular server or container and whatnot? So you will, you will be able to access that um, on this page. Uh, what else is here? So you can also see um, all the queries being triggered by this one single transaction. So if you are very much conscious about your database performance, uh, you can quickly access the database query to, 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 to access those information. Um, yeah, so in this, in this particular transactions, um, database was only contributing 2% of the time. Most of the delay is actually coming from the other service on the other end, which is the, um, the older service, right? Um, before I drill down, I just want to touch on a couple of things. So you have the option to decorate your data as well. So we collect a whole bunch of attributes by default. Um, but you know, obviously, for troubleshooting purposes, for you know, uh, understanding bottlenecks, or even like for business reporting, there are attributes in your application that, application that you might want to track using our API. So in this case, uh, we are tracking the uh, dollar figure of the transactions. We are tracking the um, ID of the product that the customer was trying to buy. Um, and you know, we are tracking the username as well. So when it comes to troubleshooting, you have a lot of these contacts. Um, yeah, so we're not covering the, um, the advanced stuff, but in the, in the 202 track, it will also talk about you know, how you can set up Insights Dashboard and then how you can search for those attributes to bring up um, you know, the related uh, transaction as well, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's click on the Trace Details um, page. So um, the Trace Details page is basically um, allow you to understand from, from a time fashion how the transaction was being executed um, here. So you can see that we basically highlight the bottleneck here, which already know from the previous screen, uh, which is the, uh, the microservice on the other end that's causing most of the, of the delay. Um, but you can access a lot of things here as well. So the, the class name and the method name that is uh, re uh, responsible for that. And you can open up the stack trace to understand you know, which line of code, which classes, which method uh, you should be looking into. Right. So going back to the cross-application tracing uh, feature, um, this is also available in the trace screen as well. So if you want to follow this transaction to go to the other side, uh, you can click on this little, little icon there, and that will show you the trace um, that is happening on the infantry service, and then you can continue the troubleshooting process. Right. That's pretty cool. Okay, so we talk about performance bottleneck. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about um, errors as well. So back to the overview graph. Uh, let me go back to the order service application. Um, so you can access the exceptions from two different ways. You can simply click on the error rate link or you can click on the error analytics um, page. Uh, don't ask me why they're not consistent <laughs> in terms of labels, but yeah, you get that. 
Okay, so once we get to the error analytics page, um, this is basically allowing you to slice and dice all the exceptions that we caught for you. So bear in mind, the APM offering that we have, we only catch uncaught exceptions. Uh, if, you're, if your application is already catching some of the exceptions yourself, you can still send that to New Relic, New Relic and you'll be able to see that here. But we basically, out of the box, uh, catch uncaught exceptions. Right? So what can you do here? Um, you can leverage, the um, again, the out-of-the-box attributes that we collect for errors. You can slice and dice these errors by things like you know, hosts, for example. Uh, for example, if I, don't, if I want to know which server or which, which container is, is, is throwing the most amount of uh, exceptions, um, I can use the host attributes to understand that. Uh, and then I can filter down to that particular um, container. And then uh, maybe I want to understand the uh, actual transaction that is impacted, right? So uh, over the last 12 hours of, of time, uh, these are the transaction that is having, having a, a, um, an exceptions on this server. So I'm, I can keep drilling down and, and um, add more to my filter options, right? So now I'm just focusing on the order transaction of, of a particular host, and then I can break it down by error messages. Are they, are they similar? Are they different? So I can do this type of an, uh, quick analysis using um, the groupings here. So once I'm happy with what I'm seeing, once I get to a point where I'm ready to drill down, um, on the right-hand side, again, you'll find this pattern, like moving from one side to the other side within the new, new Relic UI. You, you see that quite consistent across the different products. So you'll be able to access the trace uh, when you drill down to this, uh, to this specific error code. Right? So um, again, we capture a whole bunch of um, default attributes to help you understand why this um, error is happening, where is it coming from, uh, you know, what actions and what interactions the customer were doing on the website, and then most importantly, if there's a stack trace, we'll capture that as well. So in this case, um, the web server is, has already caught the, the, um, the exception, so it's, there's no stack trace available. But um, yeah, in the, if there's a stack trace available, you'll be able to see that. Um, pretty similar to the stack trace in, in transaction trace that I showed you um, a couple of minutes earlier. Um, again, um, integration, integration, integration. So that's new, new regs very, um, you know, uh, passionate about, I guess. So um, you can set up your new relic with your ticketing systems. Uh, you can, you know, as an option, track certain errors uh, as above. So it will give you that option um, right here as well. Cool. So we cover um, the basic APM stuff. So let me just go back to the agenda quickly. Okay, so I think we pretty much covered the first three topics. So it's lab time. So I'm gonna get you to access your um, TSS account. Yep, so for those who have access, please go to your um, New Relic UI and access your training account and go to the Pet Clinic application. You might notice there's two applications there. One's Foot Me, one is Pet Clinic. Um, go to the Pet Clinic one. And basically, uh, let me just show you where you should go as well. Um, so, Pet Clinic. Uh. So let me get you started. So when you go into Pet Clinic, um, go to last 24 hours, and you should be able to see a spike like this. So it's about 2 AM Sydney time. There's a performance spike. 
So um, the, the concept of the exercise is not trying to troubleshoot this uh, crappy application, but just to get familiar with the, the flow of how you drill down to look at things like transactions, uh, database, uh, and just getting familiar with the, the, the navigation of APM, APM in terms of troubleshooting. So um, I'll, I'll go through that you know, um, after you guys are done with it, but there's, there's no right or wrong answer, but the concept is really trying to get you guys to familiar with the, the, uh, the flow. So um, let's spend maybe f yeah, eight minutes on this, um, and then we'll, we'll show you some more stuff. Uh, anyone who have trouble with the access, uh, my colleagues over there, Andrew, will be helping you out. And I can help you out with the, the guy in the front as well. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to practice this using your own account, feel free to do that. No problem at all. Again, if you have questions about you know, what we talk about or anything else, just leave that till the break. Uh, we'll be hanging around and answer any questions that you might have. Anyone want to share his, uh, your feedback? What did you find? Couple of what? Coding errors. Coding errors, yeah. And where, where did you start to figure it out? Did you drill from the main graph or you went to the error rate? Error rate. Okay, that's good. Anyone else? Any uh, low hanging fruit that you found? <laughs> cool, all right, we'll quickly go through this. Um, yeah, so definitely um, error rate is something that you wanna look into. Uh, there's a couple errors here that, um, yeah, we caught a couple of exceptions. So again, uh, using the drill down, you can get access to the trays. That's pretty cool. And then from a response time perspective, back to the overview graph, um, if I, uh, for example, zoom into one particular spike. Uh, you'll be able to like um, drill down to a particular tier. So when you look at a bigger time frame, sometimes it's hard to you know drill down and look at you know database time or external time. Um, the trick is either you zoom in or you, you let, never leverage the menu on on the right hand side on the left hand side. Sorry. Okay. So if we drill into the database tier, uh, we'll see a couple queries running really slow at that time. Again, you know how to navigate to look at the actual query. You select a statement that you're interested, and then scroll all the way down, and then you'll be able to access those detailed information. So. Uh, that will definitely come up in the certification process. And then in terms of um, the delay coming from the code itself, uh, we definitely see some of those here as well. So if we drill down to the blue area, um, that will break down you know, all the different transactions that was being impacted within the, tier, uh, within the window. Again, if we look at the uh, the breakdown, we obviously see a, a big chunk of time being spent in the uh, owner controller process find form um, method, right? So even though there's some delay coming from the database, the biggest delay is actually coming from the code. And again, using the trace, uh, we'll be able to validate that. So you can access the stack trace here. Yeah. Uh, you notice that, um, just to quickly cover this particular point, uh, when you access the trace, 
Sometimes you'll see this little blue bubble. Um, this is indicating that our agent has an instrument all the way to the, to the code because of some custom frameworks that you might be using or um, you know, New Relic doesn't support the framework that you use by, by default, uh, which is not end of the world. You can always configure New Relic to instrument further into your application. So when you do that, um, you'll be able to see all the way down um, to the classes and the method level. All right, so if you, if you ever see this, um, don't panic. Uh, this actually would be covered by the 202 track as well, um, just so you know, but we're not covering that detail in this track. But if you ever see this, just so, just so you understand, it's because uh, the agent hasn't been configured properly to instrument the whole way. Uh, it, it can be configured, so. Cool. Okay, so that's the lab number one, pretty easy. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of things and then we can break for um, a little coffee break. Yeah, how about that? Okay, so we touch on the deployment marker. So I, I just wanna spend a little bit of time uh, expanding on that. So, um, yeah, so this is how a deployment marker would look like when you mouse over on the graph, right? So basically, it will tell that you know, there was a deployment change at that point in time made by someone, and you can add some um, you know, um, information about the, the, the update yourself. So when you click on the line, it will actually bring up the deployment report. right? So to access the deployments itself, uh, when you go to the left-hand menu, click on deployment, uh, you'll be able to see all the historical deployments. Uh, and the way it works is, it's pretty simple. So we got a bunch of APIs, obviously. Um, one of the API is for you to integrate to tell us when you make a change in your code, right? So whether it's using Jenkins or uh, in, if you're using, uh, using .NET, you, you know, you're potentially using Octopus Push or other stuff, right? So as long as your deployment tool has capability to call an API, then you can call the new Relic deployment API. And that will basically mark the, the event on the graph and also um, do a before and after report from a performance perspective. So, um, yeah, so basically, this is the before and after report. We look at six key metrics uh, in terms of like things like response time, throughput, CPU, memory, and so forth. All right, so you can access all these goodies. Uh, basically, the, the, the gray bar in the middle is when the deployment happens. So we give you before and after uh, across all these metrics. This is at an, at an application level, right? So if you want to look at um, uh, individual like transaction level, so let's say you made some changes to a particular API call or you only, you only updated a certain transactions, you can access the change report and we'll also give you the before and after for those uh, individual transactions as well. Um, and you can sort this by, you know, um, different, different um, metrics and attributes. Mm, doesn't change much, does it? Yeah, anyway. So yeah, so that's deployment. Uh, we have a really cool um, UI for our API, so I, I just want to briefly touch on that. So if you go to api.newrelic.com, uh, you see a UI for pretty much all APIs. <laughs> We're still working on that. It doesn't have all the APIs, but uh, pretty close. So when you go here, um, you should be able to select the, key, the API key from the drop-down menu. Um, if you have issues with the key, just email support at newreg.com or contact your account administrator. Um, either way, we can, we can fix you on that. And then when you select a key, um, then you can actually use the UI of this API Explorer to test out some of the stuff. So basically, the, um, the API of New Relic basically provides you things like you know, exporting your data offline, um, updating your alert configuration, and obviously marking the deployments, right? So if you look at this particular guy here, application deployment, uh, the create API calls is what you need to make after you uh, deploy a change in production. Right, so we give you a little UI here to 
Um, okay, so let's say, um, let's try this. Um, so this is the application ID. Oh no, this is the application ID. And I'm gonna put it here, and I'm gonna put some information. So, stack, Sydney. So I can customize the information that I want to add to the deployment event. And um, you can actually test this out. And we'll um, give you a little curl command as well. Um, so this is actually going to post something to your account. So when you um, do this, just be aware of that. So everything that he, uh, available on the API Explorer, when you click that button, it will actually submit uh, an API request to your account. So just be aware of that. Yeah, but basically the API Explorer is going to help you understand what's available and help you um, fast track your um, integrations. So it's pretty cool. So that's that. Um, yeah, I think we're good for a little 20 minutes break. So come back at 3.20. And then we've got a whole bunch of other topics to cover. So. All right, guys, welcome back. So we're going to push things along the way. Uh, looks like some of you guys already switched to the 202 track, so good job, guys. Um, so we're going to cover a couple more topics in the second half, and um, you're happy to do some Q&A after the second half as well. So just to recap, we talk about how APM works in general, uh, what other capabilities you can leverage with the new Relic platform, uh, and then we've gone through a couple scenarios in terms of using APM to troubleshoot application issues. Um, we spent some time looking at app decks, um, the deployment markers, and we drew down to the errors and the transaction trace as well. So those are, the, I guess, the, um, a, a good start in terms of understanding the fundamentals of APM. And then there's a couple other things that I want to cover today. Uh, in terms of the one-on-one -on -one track, so key transactions, how you can use that to um, you know, shorten the time for you know, looking for things and finding things within the UI. Um, permalink, we'll probably cover that as well. Um, and obviously, alerting is a big thing, right? So you, you don't have time to look at dashboard and transaction trace all day long. So we want to make sure you guys are aware of you know, the alerting capabilities so you can be a bit more proactive and, and receive things uh, when it matters. Um, and then we'll jump into insights to, as an introduction to understand the concept of you know, metrics and events. And then we'll wrap up with um, just an introdu introduction of the certification process. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you can you know, go home and give it a go tonight or whatever you're free. Um, and hopefully you know, it's a positive result at the end. So that's what we kind of cover um, in the second half. Okay, so jumping back to my um, training account. Key transaction. So when you drill into transactions, um, there's a lot of things uh, being reported out of the box, right? So in, in a real scenario, you'll probably have a much uh, longer list here. So we have this concept of key transactions where you can kind of bookmark the transactions. Uh, and then you can do a couple more things once you do that. Um, so you'll find the key transactions um, link right underneath the transaction name once you drill down. Uh, this owner transaction has already been bookmarked, so it will say view key transactions. Um, if I click on this, yeah, so if, if it hasn't been tracked as a key transactions, um, then you will see that option. So when you click on that, uh, you will, yeah, okay. Cool, so I tracked that. So, 
Sure, let's go back. So when you focus on a transactions, you click on that guy there. Track as a key transactions. Um, I'm aware there's a new UI coming out, so we'll provide more options here. Um, so I was a little bit freaked out when I don't see the new options, but that's okay. Just track it as a key transaction and we'll move forward. Um, so once you track that, um, you'll be able to see all your safe or bookmarks of transactions in the key transactions area. So you'll be able to do a couple of things. Um, so going back to the AppDAX scenario, there will be some transaction that is taking longer than the others, and it's completely normal for, you know, for your application, right? So you, you do want to track those separately. So once you track something as a key transactions, then you can adjust the T value um, for this particular transaction. So basically, if you have a transaction that is always taking you know, two seconds because maybe it's a job running in the back end, Maybe it's a complex transaction that will talk to different things and write to the database. If it's taking two, two seconds all the time, it's no good having a half a second T value overall, right? Because it will skew the data. It will send you a lot of false alarm. So you can adjust the T value for just this particular slow transactions. And then uh, it will basically help your AppDAX reporting. So you can do that from here. Uh, what else is available. So when you click on the key transactions, uh, you get something like this, which kind of look like a main overview dashboard, uh, but it's only focusing on one thing, which is your key transactions. So the concept of key transaction is, you know, if you have something that is important for you, important for the applications, or, you know, you just roll out this new API call, you want to track that separately, um, probably, it's probably a good thing to track that as a key transactions. And then you get things like you know, dedicated dashboard like this. Uh, you can set your own AppDAX T value. And then you can access the errors and the trace right here. So it's all dedicated for this one thing. Um, we also offer a couple other things as well, um, such as SLA report, which will give you the um, you know, the metrics over time, how's this particular page or transaction perform over time. So it's available um, here as well. Um, X-ray function is available on certain languages. Um, I think it's Ruby, Java, and one other languages. So X-ray session is a feature available when you track something as a key transactions. And then you can fire off a on-demand X-ray session it usually lasts for about you know, one minute or 10 minutes. You can actually choose. Uh, oh, OK, actually, we just bump it up to two hours as well. So basically, it allows you to collect a lot of trace. right? So if you feel like New Relic isn't giving you the trace that you need to do your troubleshooting exercise, you can fire off an X-ray session on demand um, to, to focus, laser focus on one single thing, and it will capture a lot of trace for you. So X-ray is available. Uh, once you track something as a key transaction, uh, only for certain languages. Andrew, remember which language? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Java, definitely. Uh, Ruby, and one other guy. Not done that. Sorry, guys. Okay, cool. Um, so that's key transactions. I uh, do want to go back to the transaction page because um, when I walk around, uh, I think there's a couple questions around transactions and in particular the numbers. Um, so I want to just spend a little bit of time just just um, reiterate those. So when you drill into a transaction page, uh, it will default rank the transaction by most time consuming. So what that means is over the last X days or X hours, um, depends on what you're looking at. These transactions are the most expensive one. So when we mean by 34.6%, it means that over the last 24 days, this owner transaction is taking up 34.6% uh, you know, of the system uh, <coughs> resource, right? And <clears throat> when you mouse over it, you will be able to see the actual response time, so 621, and it's being executed quite often, like 64 times per minute. So that's why it's most time consuming. 
And usually these are the low-hanging fruit that you want to target when you're first starting to use New Relic. Uh, and, then, and then you start tackling the first three or first five to optimize those. It will obviously free up the resource to run the other transaction as well. Um, you do have the option to choose things like, you know, look at the highest throughput transaction so you know what's important from an application standpoint. Um, LPM stands for request per minute. Right, so that's pretty uh, pretty basic, and then we also have the option to look at you know just look purely looking at the response time, uh, yeah, you can rank that by the slowest transaction as well. Yeah, so these yeah all these guys are pretty much um, yeah. So sometimes when you go back to your own account, you might notice the slowest transaction isn't the one that is being used the most. So you might not want to spend time optimizing that. So you do have to look at the throughput, the average response time, and that's how we come up with the concept of most time-consuming um, transactions. And then similarly, on the database side, uh, we have similar concept as well, most time-consuming. Time Again, this is the total time over the last 24 hours in this case. For that statement, how much time does it took to, to execute? And when you obviously drill down to it, you can see it's only taking 8.5 milliseconds every time, right? So you do have to look into different perspective. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the alert side of things. Um, let's quickly look at the most basic stuff, which is the downtime alerts, right? So it's good that APM is telling you a lot of things about your application. But if your application is down for whatever reason, APM would not tell you anything, right? If your hosting provider is letting you down or something wrong with one of the key providers, no user can access your application, we'll, we'll get nothing, right? So it's, it's important to also look at the downtime um, uh, scenario as well. So uh, for those who have used New Relic for, for, for a while, you might remember this um, availability um, feature. Um, yeah, so this is the, the legacy way of New Relic measuring uptime. Um, so if you are still using that, it's okay, but you know, probably consider switching to synthetics because that's probably a more updated version of measuring uptime. It, and it also provides a couple more features as well. So yeah, if you haven't used the availability feature here, don't bother, just switch to synthetics, and you can do the same over there as well. So real quick, going to, into synthetics, we're not trying to cover the whole lot. Um, that's probably more the 202 track. We're just gonna cover the uptime scenario. Um, so you can see there's a couple checks already running against our new Relic blog uh, on the, and a couple other um, dummy websites. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up a downtime alerts for newreg.com. So these are the pay options within the synthetic product, the simple browser, the scripted browser, uh, and the API stuff. So these are the selenium, selenium flavors of synthetics, uh, the ping stuff that is something that I want to cover today. So I want to set up a new relic downtime. And feel free to um, go through this while we, while we are uh, doing this on the stage as well. So you can absolutely set up something for your website on this account and see, see in action. So I'm going to set up a New Relic home page check. Um, so the URL is all you need to, to set up the, um, the uptime um, monitor. Uh, it's optional for you to define a little piece of content that you want us to check when we do the uptime check. So sometimes the web server might be up, but it might be showing you, you know, an error page or, hey, come back later page. So if you put the validation string there, it will validate whether the web server or the application server is actually serving the right content as well. And then, um, so Synthetic is um, a product that you can request our robots to check it for you. So these are the public robots um, available. So obviously we got Sydney on the, on the, on the option here and a couple other uh, Asia Pacific cities. Um, so basically we got about you know, 15 locations to choose from. And um, if you really need to check from you know, within the intranet, for example, or if you really need to check from New Zealand, then you can, you can set up what we call private location. We're not gonna cover that today, uh, but there's an option as well. 
So let's say I want to check the new Relic um, <clears throat> website from a couple locations, San Francisco, London. And then I can also tell New Relic how often I want to know about the uptime. So for the more critical stuff you want to check more often, the less critical stuff, maybe every 10 or 15 minutes will be okay. Um, so the ping check is complimentary. So if you are a New Relic customer, you can leverage this feature uh, at no cost. Uh, I'm going to cover the alert side of things later, so I'm just going to say do not notify anyone just yet. And then that's it. So uh, it's a one-page setup. It's pretty simple. Um, all you need is the URL, and we'll start telling you the, uh, the, the information and the, um, and the downtime information. Cool. OK, so let's go ahead and set up the alert. So we got the, great, so we, we got some checks coming in. So let's set up the alerts uh, on top. So we go to the alert menu at the top right corner. And then we go to the alert policy. Um, so when you go to the alert policy page, these are the existing policies in the account. So it depends on your user uh, um, permissions. Um, you can set up a new policy if you are an administration user and so forth. So I click on create a policy. And then I'm going to name this policy. So we typically recommend customers to set up a policy at a team level, like a DevOps team or you know, a QA team, or at the product level. right? So if you have different products within the company, uh, you want to set up a policy maybe at that level to start with. And then once you define the policy, um, you can start chucking in conditions. So conditions are things that you want to be alerted, and you can have multiple conditions, right? So um, let's start with the basic stuff. I want to um, cover the downtime first. So that's my uh, home page. Um, and then I want to name this. Hopefully that never happens, but who knows? Um, so that's my first condition. Uh, and then I also want to cover um, conditions where, you know, um, uh, when we have a bottleneck coming from the APM side, right? So that's back to the APM stuff. Uh, APM is choose, cho it's being chosen by default, but you, as you can see, you can access all the different modules uh, within here. So if you care about the front end, if you are front end developers, you can set up alerts on the, on the browser side. If you are an uh, infrastructure guy, then you can um, go to the infrastructure section and set up um, a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but for today's purposes, we're going to focus on a couple things. Um, I'll show you um, the, t the classic application metrics options, and then I'll also show you the new baseline option as well. So I'm going to go ahead and um, select the applications. So in your account, you might have like lots of apps, like 60 apps or you know, 100 apps. You can search for it as well. Uh, you can see the option called label. So label is something that you can leverage within the Relic and tag your app. So let's say you have 15 production apps. You can tag those as production. And you can easily find them, uh, uh, locate them using the label options. So I'm going to go ahead and set up the alerts for um, our favorite, favorite app, Pet Clinic. Um, I'm going to look at error rate, first of all. So when you click on the uh, drop-down menu, we'll give you the, the top six, uh, I guess, most common scenario where you want to be alerted. So things like error rate. So I want to know if the error rate is above 10% for at least 15 minutes. All right. So there's two levels of um, thresholds. There is the critical thresholds with the red cross, and then there's also the warning thresholds as well, which is the yellow exclamation mark. Um, so bear in mind, the yellow um, warning thresholds is not going to trigger an alert. It's just going to change the background of the dashboard to yellow, just as a visual alert. So 
For, for the level that you want to be alerted, that's the critical level on the top. And then the, the, the warning level is an option to let you know if the error rates start to go bad and will change the color of the, uh, of the dashboard that you saw in, in the um, first section. All right. Cool. Um, so if you guys have internal wiki pages and stuff like that, you can also add the link to the Rumble URL as an optional thing. So when a, a new employee joins the team or you know, when the second shift guy comes online, uh, when they receive an alert, they can simply click on the run book URL to access the wiki page so they know what to do. Maybe restart the server or kick something or call Telstra. You know, you, you can do <clears throat> different things using that option as well. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. Um, so we got the error rate. We got the downtime. So we're good. So we probably need something to cover the bottleneck perspective, right? So I'm going to add another condition here. I'm going to use the baseline option this time. And um, you'll see why when I get to the page. So similar process, choosing the app, go to the next step. Um, so the, the baseline option is basically going to leverage our uh, dynamic baseline capabilities. Um, so behind the scene, we have these new machine learning capabilities where we you know, learn about the applications uh, and we build a baseline for a couple of metrics, right? So for the time being, we're looking at response time. Uh, this is the baseline. You probably see a little gray area at the top. Um, and we can choose to visualize the baseline over a seven days period or a two days period. Um, and you can start to tune the sensitivity of the, of the alert as well. Cool. So, so this is the baseline of, of the last seven days. And the purpose of the graph here is to help you um, fine tune your alerts, right? So this is the response time in blue, and you can see a couple spike. Uh, and one of those violated the baseline that we have configured so far. So those arrows at the bottom, will indicate if that happens, you get an alert, right? So if you want to be really sensitive, um, and you can see the changes in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the baseline, and you can also choose like uh, how, how quick you want to receive the alerts, right? Yeah, so if I choose to uh, receive an alert when the baseline is being deviated for two minutes, then that's the amount of errors that I'll get using the, um, the number of errors at the bottom. So that helps you fine tune your uh, baseline alert. Um, the other common metrics that I've seen customers um, setting up this dynamic baseline is the throughput. So maybe as an application owner, I want to know about the application throughput. I want to make sure it's, it's you know, going up and down constantly. I, I, I know I have some, you know, off-peak hours during the night, but I, I want to know it's you know, within the baseline. I'm, I'm con getting constant traffic. I'm getting customers to buy stuff on my website, you know, or I'm getting customers using my application. Right? So I want to know about the, the throughput as well. So let's do that. Um, yeah, so you'll see a little spike here because we were running some load tests against the pet clinic just to create the spike for you guys to troubleshoot so you can see the, 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 the spike in the throughput, right? But uh, I'm going to go ahead and set this up. It's cool. All right, cool. So we've got a couple um, scenarios that is, will be triggered in a, an alert. So all these different alerts will be triggered um, uh, when they're being validated. So it's basically an or logic. So if the, if the throughput goes beyond the baseline, or if the error rate goes beyond the thresholds, or if the home page is down, all this scenario uh, will trigger an alert. Um, so just to want to talk about, just want to talk about the, the, uh, the preference option as well. So by default, um, if, if any of the condition trigger the policy in terms of alert, um, then you will get one alert, right? So what that means is if your, if your home page is down and then your error rate start to go um, skyrocket, uh, you, you get one alert because the downtime alert has already captured that. 
the, the more sensitive option is to choose the by condition option, which means um, each of the condition will trigger an alert. So basically, if your home page is down and your error rate is going high, then you'll get two types of alerts, right? And then finally, the, the most you know, <laughs> uh, bombarding condition, I guess, is you know, every single time the home page is down during the, the incident, you'll get an alert, right? So these are different levels that you can, you can leverage from an incident standpoint. Um, again, Couple of options here. I mean, um, you might have you know maintenance windows over the weekend. You might have um, uh, you know um, deployment windows that you don't want to have any alerts trigger. You can either use the the radio button here to manually switch things off, or you can use our API to automate um, that as well. Um, what's coming in the product is we're going to introduce maintenance windows. For alerting, so you can control like every every Saturday, um, you know, I'm gonna have this particular maintenance windows where either no alerts or you know I don't want to report anything. So you have those options. So it's coming uh, in terms of the in terms of the roadmap. Okay, so I covered the downtime stuff, which using the uh, the synthetic product. I cover the APM, you know, the sort of typical um, alerting scenario that you wanna. Set up. So let's take a quick look at the notification. All right. So because I'm setting up the alerts, um, the policy will have my name automatically added, but I can certainly add you know other team members to the to the channel. So the the most default one is obviously email, and I can you know um, uh, not this one. Sorry, user. So if your colleague is already part of the New Relic account, you don't have to add him as an email address. You can just simply pick and choose from the user option. So I can pick, for example, Max sitting right here, my colleague. I want to add him to the alert, and Andrew as well. Hey, must be a feature. <laughs> cool. I got those guys, and then I have a Slack channel internally as well, so I can set up the integration with Slack, and then I can post alerts to that as well. Um, just uh, one quick note here. With the email options, if you download our new Relic mobile app and log in to the app using the email address, uh, you also get a push notification on the mobile side of things as well. So we don't do SMS, but we can provide push notification. Um, so these are the, um, let me just show you the notification channel page. So this is where you go, ahead, go, go about setting up like uh, integrations, and these are the things that we support out of the box. Um, you know, the, top, the, the popular one, like PageDuty, our sponsors today, Slack, uh, HipChat, from Malazian, obviously. Uh, there's also a webhook option. So if you don't see the thing that you want to talk to on the, on the menu, you can leverage the webhook option. So things like you know, Microsoft Teams or ServiceNow, Service Desk, uh, and other things like that. So as long as your um, platform that you want to integrate with New Relic has the capability to receive webhook calls, then you can, we can talk to those using that. So. Yeah, okay, so I think I've covered um, everything I want in terms of alerting. Um, let's do a little lab. All right, so let's do a quick lab. Um, the challenge is create a policy that will send you an email alert when the pet cleaning app has more than 100 hit per minute uh, for at least five minutes. So I'll give you guys uh, maybe another eight minutes to give it a go. 
Um, just make sure you name the policy with your name as well, so we know you have, you have a give a go. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, uh, Max and I will be here to answer any questions as well. Don't be shy. Yeah, excellent question. So the question is in synthetic pain, uh, I guess the question is why you can do a validation. Is that right? Well, I'm just assuming it's not a ping. I'm assuming it's an HTTP. Yeah, correct. So we, we label that as a ping, but technically we're actually doing an HTTP get. So we're actually downloading the HTML portion from the website and then do a quick validation. So it's a little bit more than a ping. Yeah, go for it. Um, you, you go through our transaction delivered by RPM or percent milliseconds and so on, and you can adjust the access key for each transaction. Mm -hmm. I just consider it might be quite frequent that the, uh, the most um, heavily heavy usage transaction is actually the most optimized. Correct. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's an option to rank by app deck score. So there's, there's four options. So most time consuming, throughput, uh, and just purely looking at response time. And I think the third, fourth option is to look at app decks. So yeah, you're correct. Yep. Great questions. Okay, so it looks like uh, my bad. Some of you guys might have been added to the training account as a user, user, user. So because you're not an admin user, you cannot create the alert policy. So I'll quickly fix up those guys.
Yeah, this is an excellent example why we have an API. So now I'm manually fixing your permissions. I think you guys should be good now. All right, I think you guys have a good go at it, so it's fantastic. So the lab was, just to remind you guys, uh, create a condition where pet clinic get 100 hits or more for at least five minutes. So how do I go about doing that? So the product that will give you the, the request per minute is obviously APM. Uh, it's an application metrics, so we're going to go right into it. Pet clinic. Web transactions is the one that we are interested. Yeah, so you, you notice there's two options here. So the first option is we wait for that condition to happen for X amount of time. Um, the other option is when it spikes up, you'll be um, notified immediately. So that's two options. So the one that for the lab is for the, uh, it's the first one, right? I'm pretty sure you guys crushed that. So, all right. Going back to the agenda. So we're going to cover a little bit of insights, looking at um, specifically you know, metrics, events, how do you apply those, where you can find those, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, looks like we're going to be ahead of time, which is fantastic. So we'll cover off the certification and do a quick Q&A. Um, unless you guys have any other topics that you want us to cover today, um, otherwise that's that's my plan. But yeah, we're open, we're flexible, so cool. So let's talk about um, metrics. So everything that you see within APM uh, in the UI itself 
uh, we consider that as metrics, right? So metrics can be, ooh, metrics can be, um, you know, throughput, metrics can be response time, um, metrics can be, um, you know, for a particular transaction, how much time does it spend in your database? So that's all categorized as metrics, right? So when you mouse over any of these graphs, uh, it will allow you to add to the dashboard. So you'll probably see here, um, this guy here, add to an insights dashboard. Um, so let me quickly show you what that does, and then I'll, I'll go through insights a little bit and also cover events. So when you do that, so let's say I'm, I'm building a dashboard. So the use case here is maybe I want to customize a dashboard. I want a couple of things to show up on my dashboard um, constantly. So I want to see uh, throughput. So throughput. So that's my metrics title. And then I'm going to create a new dashboard. So I got that as a metrics widget in Insights. And then I just want to grab the response time as well. So I can mouse over the, the APM chart. And I can say, add to Insights dashboard. And this is the dashboard I have previously created. So I can just select that one and say, add to that. And then um, maybe I just want to grab the error rate as well, just as an example. So if I jump into this dashboard uh, in Insights, um, yeah, that's cool. So that's my dashboard that I quickly created using the metrics um, way, right? So I got the throughput here, I got the response time, and I got the error rates. So basically, um, in Insights, there is a section called Data Explorer which allow you to access all the metrics that we collect um, across all the products, right? So if you go into the metrics tab of the Data Explorer in Insights, you will see the different product name that we have, uh, APM, mobile, browser, and so forth. And then you want to pick an app that you're interested in. And you can imagine we have a lot of metrics, right? So um, the best way, perhaps, to get started is to look at what's, what's your interest is from the main APM over, uh, UI and grab those to, to start setting up a dashboard. Or uh, maybe you, you're interested in a particular metrics, right? For example, maybe the... Um, um, the ext uh, maybe the visits, right? Maybe the visits. I want to understand the number of visits on the front end of my particular website, right? So I can I can get that as a as a metrics. Um, the other popular metrics that I've seen customers, you know, creating a dashboard and so forth is the database uh, met related metrics. So uh, in here you can drill down to a particular category of metrics, and the database metrics is sitting in the data, data store category. Mm. That's the best part about being an engineer. There you go. So these are the different things that you saw in the APM UI, right? So the, the, all the select statements and all that kind of stuff is actually available as a metric. So if you want to pick out these metrics to graph on a dashboard, um, this is where you can get started as well. Just to give you an ex example, um, I want to graph the, uh, the VET select statements. Um, if I have multiple servers um, providing those metrics, I can even break it down by hose. In this case, there's only one hose. But you know, imagine you have multiple servers um, providing the same application service, 
then you can break it down by host as well. Um, in terms of the metric, we, we actually provide quite a few different options as well. So the typical way of visualizing the metrics is response time. But sometimes you might want to look at um, throughput, right? So you can look at number of statements being, being called. Or you can even look at like standard deviation um, of the response time of the statement. So there's a couple of flavors that you can leverage here. But the concept of metrics is we're already collecting the data. Right, we got the UI um, in APM that we are providing you this, you know, uh, what we call you know, created experience, right? But what if you want to gather those metrics for a custom dashboard, right? So that's the uh, the typical use case of using metrics. Um, the other uh, use case of using the metrics uh, is for alerting. So let's say I have, um, you know, laser focus on a particular SQL statements because I just roll out these new features. I want to know about the response time of a particular statement. So let's say this is uh, the one that I'm interested in. So I'm, I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to go back to my alerts. And I'm going to add another condition based on that database related metrics. Uh, it's still within APM. Um, that's the food me app that I was looking at. So in the uh, most popular metrics drop-down menu, you will see this guy called custom metrics. Um, so you can either like start typing, um, that will do the same search that you saw in Insights, or um, you can copy and paste the metrics here as well. I think that's it. Um, yeah. And then you can define what you want to be alerted based on that metric. So, um, so that will be the, the response time, or it can be throughput as well. So it could it give you a really flexible way of leveraging those metrics that is being collected by APM and have those as a custom metrics alert, right? So very similar concept, but the, the trick is you go to the um, insights um, data explorer to look at what's what you want to focus on or leverage the UI to to pick out the, the things that you're interested in, and then go to set up a dashboard uh, in insights or setting up an alerts using the custom metrics option okay so so this kind of opened up this the section about um, insights right so uh, you, you probably have seen the sessions in the morning where you know, some of our customers share their uh, insights experience and dashboard. So insights is basically our analytics layer. Um, when you start using the, the different new Relic products, those data events, so we're, we're jumping into events now. So the, those data events will be streamed into insights for you automatically. Right, so you don't have to worry about storage or you know, indexing the events and all that kind of stuff. So we, we do that for you as a service. So whenever there's a transactions, whenever someone is hitting a page on your front end, whenever you are doing a ping check, they are all events. Right? So those events will be stored in insights. And the way to access this event um, is by using what we call the NLQL, which is something that was being built by our founder, Lou Cerny. Right? So, uh, you can start typing, and um, this query tab here is obviously autocomplete. So what you can do is you can say, uh, I'm just curious of what's being, what event is being collected by APM. So I can say select star from, um, and you will see a, quite a few different options of events. Um, APM, in this case, is the last two options. So we've got the APM transaction in the transaction events, and then also the errors in the, in the transaction error event separately. Um, so I'm curious of what errors is happening. So I'm going to do a query. And just, oh, nothing there. Uh, maybe there's no errors. Let's try one day. Good. All right, there's some. So 
every single row here is an error event, right? That is happening within the last day. And you can see the time of the event. Uh, you can see the default information that we collect as part of the event. So things like the name of the application, um, the time it's spent in different tiers, like database, external calls, and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, we are looking at errors. So we capture the exception class and the uh, error messages here along with the events. So it, it really gives you a flexible way of creating custom view using the events information, right? So um, maybe I want to know about the number of errors uh, by host. So I can do a, a count star. So that will give me the number instead of providing this raw data dump. So I can do since one day. And, um, and that will give me the number of errors, right? So 107. Um, and I want to know a bit more about that. So what, which application is throwing the most amount of errors? So the, the keyword facet um, is, is the clause that will give you that breakdown. Yep, so everything, all the errors is coming from new like pet clinic. So you can see how you can leverage insights to do this real-time analytics over the event data that we store for you. So this is one way of getting access to the insights data through typing the query. The other way is um, uh, if you are not as um, you know, technical as other folks, you can leverage what we call the data explorer. We, we kind of touch on that in the metrics um, talk. So uh, we're back into the data explorer, but we're going to focus on events, right? Again, um, all the events that we have out of the box will be available from the drop-down menu. So if I want to do the same uh, visualization, um, you know, compared to what I did, just did, so I, I go to um, last one day, I go to select the transaction errors event, and then I can get a very similar visualization on a time series, right? And it also gives me the uh, NLQL, the new, new Relic query language that will create the visualization that, that I got here. Um, so from here, you, you, you can do a couple of things, right? So let me walk you through uh, what's available here. Um, again, if you want to check out what's being collected as part of the event, you can click on the blue button and you can scroll all the way and see all the different attributes. Um, you can also start using the, the group by or the facet clause as well from here. So uh, we can facet by app name, which is what I did. Right? We know all the errors is coming from Pet Clinic. So OK, I, I want to focus on that. And I want to drill down by uh, maybe error message. I want to break it down by error message. Right. So. So all of them is coming from this particular um, string exceptions, right? Cool. So all these attributes on here is available for you to slice and dice the event data, basically, right? Um, so let's try to create something real quick. Um, I want to create um, a widget that will give me the number of um, errors. Pass it by, let's see what's available. Uh, because I don't have events recently, the autocomplete doesn't really do the job here. So I'm going to switch to page views real quick. So let's change the scenario a little bit. So I want to create a widget that will give me a number of hits from different cities around the world over the last day or so. so I'm going to do that, where app names equals for me, facet. So when you type facet, it will give you all the different attributes that we collect for the, for the events. And then you can, you can break down the data. So let, let's say I want to know where my customers are coming from. I can do facet by country code. So it looks like most of the customers are coming from the US, followed by Australia, and a couple other uh, European countries. Um, what if I want to know about their response time from those countries? So I can do um, average 
uh, and then response time is duration here. So you can do that as well. So let's say I'm happy with that presentation and I want to stick it on the dashboard. So I can do, I can check out the different uh, visualizations. Um, let me just change that a little bit. Let's get rid of the account. Yeah, it'll do. So this is the, the widget for the page load time uh, from these different countries. So I want to say page load time country. And then I can start adding to a dashboard. So uh, let's go back to the one-on-one -on -one dashboard. I want to add that to that dashboard. So if I go back to my uh, metrics dashboard that I just created uh, a little while ago, I can have my event data side by side as well. So you can see how easy and quick you can create dashboard in insights using, using different flavors of, of data. You, we've got the metrics data available, and we've got the event data available as well. Right. Um, so some of our customers also leverage uh, insights to pump other events into the insights database, right? So if you have your ticketing system, if you have your CRM, if you have your you know, separate sales software that you want to pump those key information into insights, then you can leverage the, um, our insights API as well. So the insights API allow you to stream the events data as a JSON object. Um, and once they're in insights, uh, let's see whether we've got any examples. Uh, looks like we've got some alerts, custom events. Yep, so, so this is um, alert base event. So it's capturing the different alerts being triggered by New Relic, and then we stream it back to insights, right? So we can capture um, those. And then we can still leverage the NLQL capabilities on top of the custom event. So let's say you have um, you know, sales information or alert information. You can still do NLQL on top of this, what we call custom event, which is pretty cool. So I can say, um, you know, give me the number of alerts um, in the last week. Um, what about compared to a week ago, right? again. Start from alerts since it's do one day compared to there you go. Let's see if it works. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, so you can also leverage the compare with class as well and that will give you the comparison of that particular event versus you know, yesterday, versus last week, versus last hour. And, and what you can do like ultimately with insights, uh, if I can show you these dashboards real quick. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, an insights dashboard um, that you can you know, visualize the, the browser events. Right, so these are coming from our browser product, which is a very you know, front-end driven data set. So we can tell you things about your users, where they're coming from. And you can do the same for your APM event data as well. Right? So let me give you an example, another example here. So these are all the backend stuff that we collect in APM, and you can uh, create a dashboard to visualize them as well. Uh, one cool thing about insights uh, for these events, right, because it has so much you know, rich attributes alongside, right? So you can actually search for them. You can actually filter them by searching a particular keywords. Um, so let's see here. Um, I want to search by um, transaction coming from Zamuel. 
right? So I'm going to enable the filter. Looks like it's already done. OK, so I'm going to go ahead. And let's say I want to know more about this guy, Samuel, who has been smashing my site. Here you go. Yep, so I can see everything he did um, over the last day or week. Depends on the, depends on the widget. Um, and I can also use the, the time picker to say, show me what he did um, in the last hour or so. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, there you go. So you can use the combination of the filtering and, and the time picker to narrow down to a particular um, you know, segmentation. Maybe it could be a, a, a customer that you're interested. It could be a type of customers they want to focus on. Or it could be a time range that you want to visualize, right? So you can do a lot of things with insights. And remember, these these new relic events is already available once you start using new relic, and also the metrics as well. And you, obviously, you can on top of that add some custom events to to decorate your data as well. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a, an idea of you know what what is insights what you can do with insights, the differences between events and, and metrics, and some of the dashboarding functionalities. So I'm going to um, switch back to my presentation and also talk about the, um, the new Relic Universities online and the certification program. Right. So let's go to learn.newrelic.com. Um, that's basically our online university. Um, you'll be able to see that we got different kind of self-paced online courses available across our different products. So, for example, you know, Insights is pretty, very doable. It's only you know, 57 minutes of uh, online uh, videos, and then you'll, be, you'll become a, a pretty um, expert on Insights, right? So you can, you can leverage those. But most importantly, we've got this new certification uh, that's become available recently. Um, so right now, we, we got one type of certification for APM, which is um, this new Relic Pro certification. Um, I would say it should take about an hour to complete. Um, I think we allow up to 90 minutes. So once you start, clock takes started, then you can have 90 minutes to complete a multi-choice um, certification. Obviously, it's open book, so you can leverage everything that you, f you can find it from Google. Um, but I would recommend you guys to take a look at the, um, the recommendation of you know, the prerequisites, such as the, the courses on uh, new Relic universities, and um, you know, before you actually tackle the certification. So, so now you know where to find the certification. Uh, I'm going to go back and just show you maybe one or two examples of the questions so you know what, what to expect. All right, cool. So I already kind of covered that. So it's basically focused on APM. Uh, it's the, the entry level of our certification offering. So what we you know, want, to, want to kind of assess is you know, whether you understand the data, uh, whether you can you know, implement in Relic and, and set up the dashboard and alerts, whether you can actually interpret the data as well. So we, you kind of think about what you just, what we just done over the last two hours, and, and the reason why, right? So we want to touch on some of those um, aspects. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the one of the questions, right, about um, the API key. So we we touch on some of that, and. Um, yeah, we recommend you guys to do you know a bit of preparation. If you already use APM like a like a guru, like you know in the last two years you've been you know using APM in anger. Yeah, go go right into the certification, right? So, but if you haven't um, you know start using New Relic or you just started the process, then there's tons of stuff that you can leverage, you know, including the workshop today uh, and the stuff available online. So learn.newrelic.com is a, in the universities. And then you should be able to find a certification link on the on the university. Oh, we're doing really well. So, thank you guys. You've been uh, a great one-on-one -on -one, um, 
students, I guess. So uh, Max and I will be hanging around for any additional questions. Otherwise, um, yeah, you can have your little tea break before the next session's next door. So thank you very much, guys. Yeah, so the training account will be kind of you know, demolished in the next two days. Um, there's always free trial available if you want to play around yourself. So, yeah, go crazy. <laughs>